very friendly and it invites us into a radical shift. Radical even for me. Because it tells us to bypass thinking altogether. How can we do that? We're a new thought church. <laughs> See how radical it is? I mean, he's like, don't even think about it. For sure, for real. Don't even think about it. Vision. Use your eyes for this radical shift. Take a look at the world in a new way. Forget about anything you've ever learned or been taught. Think of, forget about every thought, attitude, or belief. And use your vision to see potentials that you did not yet know existed. To see possibilities that you did not yet know existed. To see life through an expanded view. Jacob Lieberman says this. He says, awareness, whoops, is curative. Awareness is curative. Curative comes, is a derivative of the word cure, which means to restore to health. In unity, the definition of health is nearly synonymous with wholeness. In unity, wholeness is not only our birthright, but it is that state of consciousness that we are continually opening to in our spiritual journey. So we are continually open to what I would call the kingdom of heaven. Jacob Lieberman, in his terms, calls it joy, inspiration, love, and gratitude. In unity, we call it joy, love, and peace. So how similar is that? But we open up to it through the way we look at the world, our willingness to expand our world view. Now, I always felt like that wholeness, that spiritual journey could be achieved or lived out with intention. Bishop Spong talks about an intention of living fully, standing in your power, loving wastefully and being all that God intended you to be. Uh, that kind of intention, and when I think about that kind of intention, for years I've talked about, well, just follow your nose. Follow your nose, point your nose in the direction of your intention, and you will go in that direction. Just like riding a horse. When you ride a horse, you get on the horse, and you want to go in a particular direction, and what do you do with the horse's nose? You use your reins to put the horse in that direction. And let me tell you, it takes a whole lot less effort to ride the horse this way than this way, right? But Jacob Lieberman says it doesn't have anything to do with the nose. The nose is coincidental. He said it has following intention, following the opening, following that attentive, expansive awareness comes from our eyes. Now, it just so happens on the human head, the eyes and the nose are in the same place, so we're okay. <laughs> but the intelligence, the spiritual intelligence that we require, the guidance that we require to live that expansive life comes through our eyes. Jacob Lieberman says we have two choices. We have the choice to be in the flow or in the slow. And I thought, well, that's very clever. <laughs> Flow or slow. Flowing or slowing. Expanding, contracting. Opening, closing. When we are flowing, expanding, and opening, we experience more and more of the kingdom of heaven. And when we're slowing, <laughs> contracting, and closing, we experience less of the kingdom of heaven. Or we're in the handbasket. Going straight to... Yuck, yuck, yuck. <laughs> yuck, yuck, yuck. So that's... Jacob Lieberman, he, he, said, he tells the story about his kids and how when they were little, he would um, it, tell the kids all the time, pick up your toys. Because he'd walk through a room and he'd notice that the toys were all over the floor. And he, he said the kids would do it if I insisted. 
But I, I was making myself very unhappy because I made my, actually he made himself crazy by saying all the time to the kids, pick up your toys, pick up your toys, pick up your toys. And one day he had the feeling and the wondering that maybe because he was paying attention, the toys were catching his eye. Maybe because they were catching his eye, it was his responsibility to attend to them. And then he got to thinking, maybe when anything catches my eye, it's my responsibility to attend to it. So he engaged in a 24-hour round-the-clock practice in which he did this. Anything that entered into his awareness became his responsibility. Anything that was his responsibility, he would attend to. Anything he attended to, he would complete. And so for a whole week, if anything popped into his head, oh, I think I'll go to the beach. Oh, I think I'll have a cup of tea. Oh, I think I'll do this. He did that, and he did it all the way through completion. And by the end of the week, he discovered he was contented. He felt happy. He felt satisfied, and he noticed that he was far more productive than he had ever been before, even though things that were catching his attention by the end of the seven days were things like picking up cigarette butts on the side of the street. <laughs> Who would have thought that that's part of somebody's holy purpose, but it caught his attention, he attended to it, and he completed that task. The other thing he noticed about his life, and I think this is the kicker, is that he spent a lot less time worrying about circumstances, hoping they would change. And that's how he got to be more productive, because he was spending less time worrying about circumstances, hoping they would change. How much time do we spend worrying about circumstances, hoping they would change? Like, I wish someone would clean up the garage. I wish there was more bank, you know, in my bank account, it was more flush. I wish my brother were happier. I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. All of that wishing and that worrying ties us into knots. It keeps us occupied. It keeps us busy. It keeps us so busy that we're just in this fog all the time. There's absolutely no clarity in our lives because we're just confused or we're overwhelmed or we're overthinking things. So when I feel confused, when I feel you put in your blank, overwhelmed, when I find myself engaged in <coughs> overthinking, I notice that I'm spending all of my time worrying about things I can't control, wishing that they would be different, instead of engaging in that spark that has caught our eye where we can be so much more productive. I know we have the capacity to do this. I really do. He, he says this. During the experiment, however, clarity emerged on its own as whatever called me became the next logical thing to do. The practice in presence, a kind of moving meditation, made me feel that I no longer needed to prioritize my schedule because life had already done that, drawing my awareness to whatever required its attention. And we have the capacity to engage in this moving meditation. In, we have the capacity to say, oh, this is the next right thing for me. This is the next right thing for me. In this present moment, this is the next right thing. We have the capacity to do all that. I know that my days here are far more productive when I come in and I just have that soft gaze, you know how you look at things softly, and I go into my office and I go, oh, this has caught my attention, and I do this, and by the end of the day, I've done far more than when I try to avoid my responsibility, like the newsletter deadline. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say, yeah. Mm -hmm. Osho says, awareness is the greatest alchemy that is. Awareness is the greatest opportunity to make a shift. Awareness is the greatest opportunity to make a change. It's when things come together so magically you recognize that a human egoic mind could not have orchestrated life that way. Think about all the inventions ever created in all the history of humankind. Things and ideas and 
processes and products and procedures that help us and support us, they've all been developed because something caught someone's attention. That someone decided that they were going to take responsibility for it. They attended to it and they completed it and created a whole new way of being. There's a story about a boy in Kenya. And in Kenya, this boy hated lions. He hated lions because his family hated lions, his family hated lions because the village hated lions, and the village hated lions because the lions would eat their cows. They would all have to work tirelessly, effortfully, to keep the herd safe. Well, at the time this boy was growing up, Kenya was becoming modernized, and the boy was required to go to school. And at school, he was required to read books. And in those books, he started to get ideas because everybody in the village took a turn being responsible for watching the herd at night. So the first time his, not his night was coming up, his overnight watch was coming up and he had read this book, he built a scarecrow because he had read that scarecrows <laughs> keep crops safe from birds. So therefore they must work on lions. <laughs> So, you know, the lion came in that night and took one of the cows. But the next time it was his turn, he built a fire because he had read in a book that fires keep wolves at bay. And the fire at first kept the lion away. The lion didn't know what it was. But as the lion became accustomed to the light and the steadiness of the light, then the lion came in and got another cow and everything was sad again. So the boy, he says, I've read about this in books. I, I'm taking responsibility. I know there's something that I'm just not seeing. And so one day he decides to climb a tree. And he gets up in the tree, and there he is looking out over the land. And this is where the story reminds me about the Gospel of John, where Nicodemus and Jesus get together. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, so he was a very high up ranking person in the Jewish faith. He was the kind of person who knew all the rules. And he knew the answer for everything. He knew the correct response for everything. So here's this Pharisee and Jesus having a conversation in secret, because God forbid a Pharisee have a conversation with a radical like Jesus. So they're having this conversation about healing and about miracles and about spiritual transformation. And this is what Jesus says. He says, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Ancient wisdom. No one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Born from above. Getting a higher perspective. Unless we get a higher perspective, we can't see the kingdom of God. Unless we have that higher perspective, we can't see how to bring love, joy, and peace to cows. <laughs> For the benefit of everybody. Lieberman says this, guidance that emerges provides a level of pure awareness that has the potential to be oh, profoundly curative because it comes from the same source that activates and regulates the entire universe. So when we get that higher perspective, we're going to have a realization that affects, positively affects, profoundly affects the entire universe that we're in. So here's this boy in Kenya, in a tree, and he's looking out where he kind of sees nothing, but he sees everything. And he looks out and he looks at his village and he sees three things. The first one is the fence that is the perimeter for the village. The second thing he sees is a pallet of battery, solar powered batteries. And the third thing he sees is a box of light bulbs. So he puts these things together. He takes a wire around the perimeter of the fence, he puts the light bulbs on the wire, and he hooks them up to the solar powered batteries and creates an intermittent light system that flashes at irregular intervals so that the lions don't know what's going on. So it was good for the village because it worked. It kept the lions away. It was good for the cows. It was good for the boy. He got him a scholarship to a university. 
It was good for everyone, and mostly it was good for the lions. Think about it. The entire universe benefited because the boy was willing to get a higher perspective, because he was willing to take responsibility, attend to an idea, and see it to completion. I don't know about you, but I don't usually have a tree handy. <laughs> Lieberman talks about this. He calls it open focus. He talks about a technique that we can use wherever we are. And he says, take your vision. We feel like we have our vision right here at the front of our face, the front of our head. He said, but take your vision about 12 to 18 inches behind and slightly above your head. And then take a look at what you see. A radical shift. The radical shift begins with that you all of a sudden are in the picture. You can be aware of everything that's going on out there, but unless you're in the picture, you're not going to see things the same. So he says open focus gives us that expansive wide angle, telescopic perspective that we need to see things differently, that we need to see life differently, that we can see broader and we can see more and we can notice what's sparking our attention, what's catching our eye. So keeping an open focus is a practice, it's a technique we can use so that we can be born again. We can have a new idea. We can get that newer perspective. Then here's the most profound thing at all, of all. Lieberman noticed that every time he had a headache or a body ache or some kind of discomfort and he was practicing open focus, his pain went away. His pain went away just by changing his perspective. He says, he says this, I, I mean, to me this is mind-blowing. After a while I began to realize that most of our physical discomfort is not caused by physical pain, but rather by our habitual identification with the mind's beliefs about pain and the suffering that often accompanies it. By seeing from a place with no point of view, the mental glue that keeps our pain intact often dissolves. I'm going to put it up there because I think this is incredibly powerful. Our physical discomfort is not caused by physical pain, but rather by our habitual identification with the mind's beliefs about pain and the suffering that often accompanies it. By seeing from a place with no point of view, the mental glue that keeps our pain intact often dissolves. And we can substitute things for pain. It can be an unwanted experience. It can be an unexpected circumstance. It can be dis-ease. When we have our open focus, it can dissolve. Can you imagine your life free and dissolved from disease, undesirable experiences, unwanted circumstances. We can just substitute it. Our discomfort is not caused by an unwanted circumstance, but rather by our habitual identification with the mind's beliefs about an unwanted circumstance and the suffering that often accompanies it. By seeing from a place with no point of view, the mental glue that keeps our unwanted circumstance intact often dissolves. It means we're going to have to change our story. It means that our dialogue with ourself is going to have to be different. Our discomfort is not caused by an undesirable experience, but rather by our habitual identification with the mind's beliefs about an undesirable experience and the suffering that often accompanies it. By seeing from a place with no point of view, the mental glue that keeps our undesirable experience intact often dissolves. It's radical. We won't know what to talk to each other about. <laughs> we laugh. It's so sad. It's true. Our discomfort is not caused by disease, but rather by our habitual identification with the mind's belief about disease and the suffering that often accompanies it. By seeing from a place with no point of view, 
The mental glue that keeps our disease intact often dissolves. Awareness is curative. Awareness is where we begin to be present. Awareness is everything. We are here to see things differently. We in this room are here to see things differently, to be that person who is the light for other people. We are here on this planet at this time to see things differently, to teach ourselves and to teach others how we can dissolve disease, unwanted experiences, undesirable circumstances, to dissolve pain. We are here to make the difference. We are here to love, we are here to serve, and we are here to remember. Let's take all of this into meditation. <laughs>